The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, author Dr. Cherith Fee Nordling explains how, from the very beginning, God has wanted His people to bear His image. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you for having me. Uh, there's a objection we often hear about Trinitarian theology and the idea that God actually loves everyone uh, that goes along this line. If God hates one person, then He doesn't love everyone. And the Scripture specifically says that God hated Esau. He loved Jacob and He hated Esau. So, how do we respond to that? Well, the first thing we do is to take the words of Jesus seriously. Yes. Instead of uh, going to a place where we can't figure out what that Hebrew idiom might mean. And if Jesus says that God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, then we trust Him. That that is the overriding narrative. And that when we watch the entire biblical narrative with these moments of tremendous suffering and pain and injustice and oftentimes just horror, it's to trust that that overarching reality, that God so loves this world that despite the broken image bearers attempt to take it down by not knowing how to do anything else in our brokenness, he will not let us be left to our own devices. He loves us too much to let the story turn out the way that it would turn out on our own. And if that is the way that the whole overarching narrative is held by the way that God is God and not by the way that we are in response to God or to one another or to anything else, then it's to look at the way that the biblical narrative is structured and given and what these incredibly important um, terms and echoes are that come through the Old Testament so that when Jesus shows up and starts saying these things out of his mouth and attributing them to him, not just divinity, but attributing all the backstory of humanity in relation to God in his own human life and where human life for everybody is going, then it's to make sure that we're really clear about what those identity markers are so that we can hear a text like and God hated Esau and say, what in the world is going on there? Besides just probably one of so many moments where, where an idiom is used to, to speak an idea that is not to be taken literally and then throw everything else out that doesn't agree with that one term. And so how do we recognize that even as English speakers, part of what we suffer from is that we, we are getting a translation of something that is an ancient language and a multi-layered and a beautiful language so that when a pronouncement like that is made, there's deep meaning to that that is not just the opposites of love and hate. And so I think to go to that deeper meaning, to look at those original echoes and then to see what then does Jesus' incarnate life mean for us, pulling us into the life of, of the Trinity, um, we, can't, we can't but not go there. And so I think that um, it's worth a little rabbit trail for a minute to just look at how the entire New Testament, which at the time that it is becoming what it is, at the time that these Gospels are being proclaimed and these letters are being written and read aloud to whole communities so that, you know, nobody's picking up the letter to the Ephesians and reading it privately and ever hearing the word you and thinking that means me and my privatized Christianity and I need to behave these ways, that these letters were taken and read to everybody in the entire community sitting there next to each other squirming about the reality that they're being called to because the only way to live this out is, is corporately, that each one individually matters as Jesus um, gives those kinds of parables, that the Father seeks every one of us and adores every one of us and will, will pursue us until he pulls us into that fellowship, but that to go after the lamb or to go after the lost coin or to, to um, be the son 
that is, is longed for. In every one of those parables, they're brought home. They're brought back to something that is bigger than them. The sun comes home. The coin is joined. The lamb is brought back to the flock, not set up in a little dyad with the shepherd out there in the middle of nowhere. And, and so I think it's, it's trying to recognize that, that salvation, though our individual life is absolutely priceless to God because we exist out of his pleasure and joy, that we, we are his delight and his image, and that he will not let anything deter his good outcome for that. That at the same time, our life lived in a way that really reflects God is lived together. So as these um, communities are hearing this and the New Testament world is um, trying to sort of reorient itself because of the reality of Jesus having come among them and, and risen in their midst, the only scripture they know is the Old Testament. That's the only Bible, you know, as far as they're concerned, because at the time, none of them are anticipating that their letters are going to end up in a canon that we are reading thousands of years later. So when these terms like Paul and Colossians using things like he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn from among the dead, or the fact that the Father uses the language of Jesus' baptism to say, you are my son whom I love and whom I'm well pleased, that these, when they hear, when, when this community hears those kinds of, of terms, there are just layers and layers of echoes that just resound. It's like hitting a gong and all of this history gets played out. And they're like, oh my goodness, he, he's what? Because they have deep resonant meaning to those things. And so starting from the very beginning to think of, of an, all of these ancient cultures having a creation narrative, every one of them. And every one of them has a creation narrative that has um, some kind of battle usually that takes place over water and the water is the place of chaos and and who knows danger lurking there and creation usually is the sort of fallout or the byproduct or the negative side of some kind of cosmic battle and once this thing gets played out then it's like well then so what do we do with this stuff if we've got those gods or that god who kind of ended up with all this stuff how do we relate to that God to keep him appeased or her making sure that we're fertile or whatever their relationship to these ancient gods is? And they all have a narrative that has this description of who God is in relation to them, life coming out of water and chaos, a description of life as sort of this temple palace garden and then there's the setting up of the image of the God in the Temple Palace Garden. And in all of these, whether it's ancient, ancient Egyptian or later Mesopotamian, Babylonian, these ancient cultures would have this um, period where if they were constructing a new temple palace for the God, they would basically sort of narrate the story that this God is about with them in the construction of the Temple Palace Garden. And the priests would come in and they would undergo what they would call a spiration ceremony or a breathing ceremony. And the assumption was is that once they sort of breathed this ritual over this idol or image of the God, that the God would take up residence there, that the presence of the God was there. It wasn't, didn't mean that the God was only that statue, but it meant that where that statue was, that God was present. And in the midst of that, whether it's probably Egypt and maybe Babylon, but if it's Egypt out of which um, God's people come and they begin to tell their own creation narrative in response to the polytheism of Egypt or the sort of the way that the gods are laid out in Genesis 1, it's like in the beginning God created heaven and the spirit hovered over the water. And then God said, and there's only ever one, and then everything that is a God in Egypt actually is just creation to God. And after six days of ordering and setting and creating time and, and purpose and meaning and dimensionality and everything else, it's on the sixth day that God says, no, you're not going to create an image for me. I am going to create my own image bearer, and I will do my own spiration ceremony. And, and we 
will create them, male and female, to bear our image. And in fact, it requires them together to be truly human because we are the triune God. And there is no such thing as a single image bearer that can bear the image of God without bearing that image in relation. And so the Genesis 2 retelling of, of what it says in Genesis 1, that here is God who chooses Adam from the earth and breathes his life into him, breathes his spirit or ruach into him. Then he becomes the one who literally is for creation. He is to name it. He is to tend it and flourish it. He is to have the one who, who completes him as an image bearer with the other. And she is called the Azer to him, the God's um, strong helper, which is the language actually that God uses about himself all through the Old Testament. You know, woe to Egypt who doesn't have Yahweh as their Azer. So she's not his right hand support system. She, with him, bears the character and image of God in the world. So for Genesis 3, then to turn around and say, and here's what happens when the story goes bust. When the image bearer fails to be the one who sees with the eyes of God, who sees what God sees, which is good in the world, and who enacts in power what God would do to, to speak for God and make these things be what they are, and have this divine human communion be not just about humanity in relation to God, but God who loves his world, everything in his cosmos, and who claims the entire creation as his temple palace garden, who's the heaven is my canopy and the earth is my footstool and takes this sort of reigning um, um, image of a, of a throne room and says, it's all mine. I love it all and you get to be the one who is for it even as you are for me and I will be for you so that I can be for all things. And so for Genesis 3 to say, and when this goes awry is when the image bearer forgets who he and she are and is. and and become ones who try to assume that their being like God is something that gives them an equality with God, which is not something to be grasped if we take Jesus' life seriously. But by grasping something that doesn't belong to them, they literally break and lose the image that they do bear faithfully and well. And so the Old Testament then becomes this ongoing story of, well, then how does God restore them? How does he lead them out of that broken place and into the promise of new life, of new creation? So they come out of this Eden and into not just barrenness, but a new Edenic situation. And so Noah becomes another story where you have water and God, whose spirit hovers as a dove over the water, which shows up again at Jesus' baptism. You have God who takes this, this person and his family out and says, I again will make a people for my name. They will look like me and bear my name and presence in the world and my power so that when they are present, nobody wonders if Yahweh is present. That is precisely who they are and what they do. And so his judgment, even prior to Noah, is these were my children, but they don't look anything like me. They're abusing and, and destroying, which has nothing to do with the character of the triune living God. He says, that is false, absolutely false to the core. And my image bearer cannot bear my name falsely in the world because no one will know who I am. So I'll, I'll pull up people for my name again. And, and you get it primarily in the Exodus where God says, out of this people, I will call a people for my name again. And he says crazy stuff to Moses in Exodus 3 and 4. He says things like, when you go before Pharaoh, who happens to think out of the entire planet that he is the only living divine image bearer of Ra, the sun god, or whoever he's instantiating, you will go to him and you will be like God to him. You will speak the words of God to him. And when I give you Aaron, you will be like a god to Aaron. You will be like God to Aaron and Aaron will be like God to him as he speaks for you. This sort of re-anointing of image bearing that says, and I will breathe my spirit into you and you will begin to function again in a way that actually looks like me and not the power down and the oppression of Pharaoh and rulership, but the releasing of humanity to start functioning is what it really is in relation to me. And it's a crossing through water again and, and light and all those kinds of images and you get it at the Jordan and you get it over and over again until finally in Ezekiel, there comes this just tragic, tragic moment where 
where after so many of these faithful regathering of his people and recalling them and renaming them and reclaiming them, he says, look, this is it. You, you look like the idols you worship. You've forgotten who you are, which is that in, a, in the technical sense of the term in that day, you are my idol. The reason you're not allowed to have any idols is because you're it. People are supposed to look at you to know what Yahweh looks like. And you have started to look like these things that you have constructed. And so you act out of that and you, you abuse and oppress and defame and hurt and destroy and choose against the other instead of for. And he says, I won't have it because it's unfaithful to what's true. It's unfaithful to the heart of love that is what allows everything to be what it is. So he says, so the image that Ezekiel gets is to watch the Spirit of God basically hovering over the ark, saying, am I leaving? Am I going? It kind of comes to the threshold and says, am I going to stay? Am I going to go? And the tragedy of the image is that the Spirit goes. And then it's, and now you will wait. And so then the promise becomes, I will take away from them their heart of stone, their law, and I will give to them a heart of flesh, and I will breathe my Spirit on them, and they will live. And so to look back at the specifically at the Esau question, you think here is God who's not only named himself with the unnameable Yahweh of the sort of transcendent glory that's so not his creation, which is him, them, however our sort of triad language gets, gets caught there. At the same time, this is the God who has no shame, no hesitancy to name himself as the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who are a mess, all three of them, and go, oh, I'm happy to be associated with them. In fact, their storyline has become my storyline. I have called them to myself. I've loved them in the midst of their brokenness and the things that they've done disobediently. And I, I am for them as I have made them for me. And so for Jacob's son or, or brother Esau to actually be the one who is the, of these twins, the first, firstborn, the true rightful image bearer, the true firstborn son who should carry that name forward. That is Isaac, who is the son who, should, who came from nowhere in terms of God's mercy. When Esau begins to look like the idolatrous people with whom he marries into and begins to rule, instead of what Yahweh looks like, God says, no, I refuse to put my name on that. I refuse to say that that is what I look like in the world. And I will stand against that, but I will do that by being for it, by coming back around and, and restoring this people to myself. And so when you finally have Jesus, who becomes this sort of messianic promise all through those major and minor prophets, this is, there will finally be one like the Son of Man, who is going to come, who God will anoint, who will actually be the one true human image bearer who will I will I have finally chosen my last and only son to bear my name and presence in the world and it all rests on him frankly to get it right to do it and, and to do it like I would have to do it not dipping in as God but to take my humanity and so out of you know from the entire human race down to this people of Israel, down to this priesthood, to this king, to these prophets. It just gets smaller and smaller to this funnel where you just finally have it rest on this one person who is God and man and having his life set the entire thing in order and then just release from that point forward from the apostolic fellowship and of the believers to become this Gentile mission, to become the whole world which is precisely way back up here at what he promised Abraham is, when I call you as a people for my name, this is like the promise to the whole deal. So that Mike and Cherith, who are not Jews and you know, aren't circumcised, will be in on this story thousands of years from now. I will be faithful to this and just, just release it through my son. So all of us who are busy trying to figure out if we are okay in relation to God, tend to forget when we get caught. And the enemy would love to cause us to look at our own image as it reflects back upon us instead of to look at the one in whose image we've been made and who stands as the perfect image bearer for us, is to keep remembering this isn't about how well I'm bearing the image apart from Jesus. The only way I get to be in on this story, the only way I get to play, the only way I get to stand 
well, even with all of the marks of my wounds and shame all over me, is to have that washed because the person who stands in for me as my high priest, who can only be my high priest if he's like me. He cannot be my high priest if he's not like me. Because the high priest is the one human being who stands in for the entire people before God. So it's God who becomes his own high priest, in a sense, on behalf of humanity. And think, if that's my high priest, who that's also what he's doing, is constantly, permanently priesting for me, permanently standing in for me, and offering the perfect sacrifice of his life and the perfect human obedience of his life, I am always, as an image bearer, joined to him in a way that, that, that the Father always holds the two of us, holds me and God's people, but always holds us with his Son to participate in something that isn't about how well I pull it off. It's the fact that it's already been pulled off. So in Jesus, you have the, the rejected Esau and the accepted Jacob, Jacob. who failed as well. That's right. Uh, healed and redeemed. That's right. And that God will go to any length to make sure that no matter how far Esau wants to walk away, that God will say absolutely no, so that his character and love for his world is not compromised. But at the same time to say every time God says no, it's so that his yes can be what it is. So to say no to that about Esau is so that he can say yes to what is really true. And he's going to say yes finally in his very own Which is the point and conclusion of Romans 11. Exactly. Where Paul brings go, it up. How do you how do you thank God for that? Which, yeah. which is beyond our, our comprehension. Yeah, it's fascinating. So I think it's just to always realize that where it's tempting to kind of say, but what about that? But what about that? It's to sort of just stand back a little bit and say, well, what would that mean in the context of this larger, incredible story that I'm in? That I'm not the primary character. It's not my private drama. It's that I've been invited into this amazing story that is God's story of his unfathomable and irresistible love for that which is not him, that he's chosen to share with him. And nothing can stop it. And so how does that thing that I'm reading, that God hated Esau or whatever we might be focusing, how would that fit into this larger narrative to understand what is the yes of God in Jesus that would say no then to these other kinds of things? And how does the suffering of the world that seems so beyond our comprehension become a no precisely by the fact that the story doesn't end with the crucifixion, that God's no to suffering having the last word has to be passed through in order to have a yes of resurrection. And so there's always going to be these beautiful mysteries of yes and no held in tension. But as, as followers of Jesus, we have to be committed to the whole story and keep seeing where we are in that whole big story instead of just sort of checking our checklist of beliefs and seeing whether they feel like they contradict each other sometimes. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul speaks of, now we, we look in a, a poor reflection in a mirror and in a mirror, of course, we see ourselves, mm. and it's this broken image bearer we're seeing. But he's saying that there is uh, something better than that that's already real that we're not seeing most right. of the time when we're not seeing Christ as the one who has taken up our cause and made it his own. So. That passage, um, if we want to spend our last couple of minutes, um, is to, to sort of look at, here's Paul writing a letter to a church he knows really well and loves very much, who are busy trying to dehumanize Jesus and to sort of super spiritualize themselves in a way that stops taking their embodied humanity seriously. And he just won't let them. You know, from the very beginning of the letter to go, we are going to preach Jesus Christ crucified. And for Paul, there is no such thing as Jesus Christ crucified. There's only Jesus Christ crucified who is the risen one, which is why we can hold this crazy thing because Jesus Christ is the risen anointed one who was crucified. And so I think very often we stop at the cross, forgetting that the cross would be very, very bad news if, in fact, he is not the resurrected and ascended one. But for him to sort of set that up and say, and now let's sort of talk about life in the church. What am I hearing? I'm hearing that... There's this division around leadership as if 
somebody has more value in the community of faith, in the community of the saints over the other, when the one who we're supposed to look like has laid his life down. So there's no, even he who was actually entitled to be over us became one for us and, and one submitted to whatever the Father would do for us. I'm, I'm hearing that you are having incredible sexual distortion between you marrying your stepmother or whatever it is, but he doesn't even address those people directly. He says, I hear among you that this has happened and that you're allowing this as a community. And you think, all oh, these people are hearing this together. And he's saying, not even the pagans do that. I'm hearing that actually you're tootling down to some pagan law court because you've got some grievance against, against your brother and you want somebody who does not have the power and authority or the presence of the Holy Spirit to usher in true justice in the kingdom of God to settle a dispute for you. When actually you whose lives are conditioned to be for the other have now been given the power and authority to actually enact justice and more than justice, mercy for the other. I hear that there are some of you who aren't sleeping together. I hear this. Some of you running down having sex with temple prostitutes, probably because you're not sleeping together. What are you doing that thinks that somehow this isn't about your embodied life? I hear some of you are eating food from temples and some of you think that's hard. It just He just keeps pressing in, pressing in, pressing. I hear you're, you're disrespecting the table and one another at the table. And he finally gets to this point. He goes, it's really sort of all about the fact that you belong to each other that you are this communal life joined to the triune God together. There's only alle lone, this Greek word that means one another. He goes, there's only one another. You love one another. You forgive one another. You care for one another. And he said, it, it let the story plot, if Corinth was looking at you, wouldn't know whose image you're being conformed into. And so when he finally says, it's all about looking like the character of God, it's loving. It's being patient and enduring and suffering long for the other and believing and hoping and trusting. And we can't see where this is all going, but, but at the same time, we can because we see him. And so when he finally calls them to their worship life and he pushes them through the behaviors that they're forgetting even in their worship life, it's all driving to chapter 15 where he's just going, and how can I say this to you, all this stuff? Because we serve one who is resurrected and is a new human. And over 500 people saw him. And the apostles saw him. And even I saw him as one untimely born. And because he is who he is and already holds our new humanity and has this body fit for the age to come, a, a spiritual body, which is like an oxymoron, but to say he's got that body fit for the new creation. Because he is that, we already know who we are. You know where this is going, and we know that actually by the power of the Spirit, we're, we're to be enacting our future reality right smack dab here in Corinth in, in a way that nobody wonders what the image of God looks like in the world because they see slaves and free people loving each other who should have nothing to do with each other. They see women preaching who should have no mouths to bear witness or say anything in a fellowship. They see prophetic gifts running all these directions. They see forgiveness where nobody anticipated. They see something that they can't see anywhere else in the world by how this odd, crazy fellowship of Jews, non-Jews, men, women, slaves, every socioeconomic, racial, gendered boundary comes together as a new people of God and says, we are going to live the life that's coming right here because the life that's coming has already come present to us in Jesus and we are in on it. And it's impossible to do without the power of the Spirit, but that would be Jesus then going, so don't leave Jerusalem because you new image bearers, new creation, need the Ruach of the Spirit, which was promised in Ezekiel 37 and Jeremiah 31 32. Saying, you need that heart of flesh and to be anointed by the Spirit to become this new people of this new age, which hasn't yet come to completion, but has already begun. So I think it's all, it is that mystery, as you said, of seeing in part, but when I think it's all too hard to figure out, I feel like Jesus says, just look here, Chara, yeah. take my life seriously. Look here, the gospel witnesses to me, and you can't over-divinize me, can't make me too much God and get yourself off the hook 
that actually I don't understand you or that you can't be like me. And I also don't want you to take my humanity so seriously that you somehow separate out that this is God who is present to you so that everything I do really does restore your life. And that's the beautiful tension that we get to walk in. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.